Jesus. Lord, we're just glad you hung there and you bled and you died for us. But Lord, you didn't stop there. Early this morning, at the break of day, you got up, Lord, with all power in your hand, Father God. You got up to save a wretch like you and me. You got up the tree of life you got up and we're just so glad about it we're glad that you sit high and you look low and you look beyond our faults but yet you meet our every need father god we just thank you for who you are and we just thank you for who we are in you we thank you lord we thank you for the angels of this house African Bishop Roddy Stevenson, Lady Doretta Stevenson, we ask you to bless the Temple Church of Christ congregation. Bless each and every visitor, each and every member. Look on the prayer list and continue to heal, deliver, and set free. Look on the bereaved this morning, Lord, and lift up, bow down heads and mend broken hearts. We just ask that you continue to be God in our lives. We thank you right now for this resurrection morning. We praise you and we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. You may, you may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Resurrection Sunday. I said, this is Resurrection Sunday. And on this Sunday, we, we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that he is alive and well, that, that, that God can make dead things live again. And because we be believe in resurrection, we believe in the power of prayer. And so often on Sunday morning, we start our service with prayer because we believe that God can answer prayer because we believe in the power of the resurrection. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus is alive and well? Can we give God a praise for that as well? This is resurrection time. And we're so honored and delighted that you have joined us today as we celebrate the Lord on Resurrection Sunday. We have a special service that we want to present to you. I'm going to ask Lady D if she'll come and give you a formal welcome. Amen. This is Lady D. And... She's going to come and she's going to just recognize everybody and thank you all for coming today. Praise the Lord, everybody. And a happy, blessed Resurrection Sunday. You know, as I was sitting there, I was thinking of a song, He Lives. He Lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know He lives within my heart. Is he living in your heart today? Amen, amen. So welcome to the Temple Church of Christ. Welcome this Sunday morning to the Temple Church of Christ family, to our guests and friends. And for those who are listening online, we say welcome. And if you're in your home, on the couch, wherever you're sitting, and once we get into the service, we want you to clap your hands. We want you to enter into the presence of the Lord. Today is a special Sunday because we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if he did not get up from the grave, if he didn't get up from the grave, 
just serving him will be in vain. The Bible says, if it's in this life only, you have hope in Christ. If it's just in this life alone, we're all men most miserable. But one day, Jesus is coming back for his people. And that's why we're living this life, to live with him again. So enjoy the fellowship. Enjoy the blessings of the Lord today. And welcome to the Temple Church of Christ. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lady D. Uh, we have an exciting service planned today. And uh, I'm going to call Evangelist Cheryl Oliver to come. Now, this is different. Also. This is a unique for us on a Sunday. We have seven speakers who are going to be speaking for 10 minutes apiece. And they're going to be speaking on the last sayings of Jesus when he was on the cross. We're celebrating the fact that he died, but we're also celebrating that he rose again as well. And as the speakers come... Uh, from speaker to speaker, you may, you're going to hear some, some music from our, our praise and worship team and our musicians. But uh, we're just glad that these, these speakers are here. And uh, Evangelist Cheryl Oliver is going to come and she's going to call them by name. They're going to join us on the, on the, plat on the platform. And then they're going, to, um, they're going to give us each a presentation concerning the last sayings of Jesus. Look, the, the reason Jesus died on the cross was not because of suffocation. He didn't suffocate. Jesus didn't have an aneurysm on the cross. Uh, he didn't have a heart attack on the cross. The, the reason Jesus died on the cross is because he bled to death. From 9 o'clock a.m. to 3 o'clock, six hours on the cross, he bled to death. And he bled for us because I should, I should have been nailed to the cross but he went to the cross and he died for me. He died for me. That, that means a lot, a lot to, for, to me. That, that he loved me so much. When I was messed up and confused on the street, didn't know left from right, he loved me. He saved me. He brought me out. He delivered me. I could have been a gangster. could have been locked up in penitentiary. I could have overdosed. I could have done a lot of things in life. But I met a man named Jesus. I met a man named Jesus. And he changed my life. He gave me joy. He gave me peace. He gave me direction. He gave me hope. That's why I lift my hands up and I praise him because I thank him. Somebody said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me. And you may say, I'm not into religion. This is not about religion. This is about relationship. That I have a relationship with Jesus because he brought me out and gave me a whole new life a new trajectory now that I'm looking for him coming back one day. So that's what this is all about. We're celebrating. On the screen, you'll see the speakers, and Evangelist Cheryl Oliver is going to come. She's going to announce those speakers, present them to you as she presents them. They will come to the platform, and they will take a seat, and then we'll have a song, and then we'll have our first speaker to come. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I bless God for this day that we're having this last seven saying of Jesus. And we have some uh, wonderful speakers to this morning. And I'm going to call them from the beginning. Number one is Minister Yolanda Bassett. We're going to ask her to come up. Amen. The next person is Minister Deron Skates. <laughs> Minister Militia Lindsay. <laughs> Amen. All right. My other speaker's already up here. Minister Pamela Laurie. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And after Minister Laurie is Dr. St. Rice. Amen. And then the sixth person will be Dr. Sandra Fields. Amen. Last but not least, Elder Gerald Freeman. Come on, give him a, a great hand. 
Amen. We're looking for a wonderful word. We did this last year and some other years on the Friday, but the Lord blessed indeed last year. So buckle down and get ready to hear what thus says the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, thank you, Evangelist Oliver. Now we're going to hear from the praise team, and when the praise team has finished their their, their song, uh, Evangelist um, Minister Bassett, Yolanda Bassett, is going to take the podium, and she has 10 minutes. Now, you're going to hear seven speakers. You're going to get, by God's grace, you're going to walk away with something because you're going to have different, seven different speakers coming from different angles talking to you about the last saying of Jesus. So you should walk away with something from one of these speakers. Come on, somebody. When I say something, some, something that has application, something that's encouraging, a takeaway. So we pray that you will receive something. So we're going to have the our praise and worship team to come, our praise team to come. And when they are done, Minister Yolanda said, you take the podium. And she's not going to do any, in, any introduction. She's going to get right into her text. All right? God bless you. Hallelujah. What a beautiful Sunday this is to celebrate our risen King. Hallelujah. These are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of his servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sore. Yet we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold ye God, shining, shining on the clouds, shining, shining like the sun, as the trumpet as calls. The trumpet calls. Jehovah, there's no God like 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 Jehovah, when we call on no God like Jehovah
Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, as Bishop uh, said before we came up, no dialogue, no how you doing, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to jump right into this. Amen. So my assignment today, we're going to start where my uh, verse starts where Jesus has already uh, been scourged. He's already been through this makeshift trial we know it was bogus and he's on the cross and the very first saying um noted or at least has been said that this is the very first saying of christ while he hung on the cross and it comes from luke chapter 23 verse 34. i'm reading from the king james version then Je then said jesus father forgive them for they know not what they do and they parted his raiment and cast lots. I'm going to start with that first word, Father. All right? So when Jesus is saying, Father, he's speaking familiarity. He's saying, Abba, because he knows God. I mean, there's been many of times where he said, Father. He has addressed God as Father. So there's that personal relationship. There's that familiarity. There's that Father. I know you hear me because you're Abba. Your Abba, we've spoken, we've talked, we commune. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, we know the Lord when he speaks. We know just by reading the scriptures and his walking that nothing is just in that time. What is done is done for then, for then, even for now, for me, for you, it is future, it is now, it is then, because God is not confined to time. So when he said, forgive them, you're thinking, well, who's the them? Is it the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, who falsely accused him and just wanted to see him die? Is it Pilate who condemned him to death? Is it, is it the, the other Jewish rulers or the people who at first decided he was the Messiah, but then said, no, crucify him, crucify him, because he didn't come the way they expected him to, and he didn't do what they wanted him to do or what they expected the Messiah to do. Was it, was it his disciples who said they would be there, but they ran off, just like he said his boys were gone, just like he said they would be? They were gone. What, what, what was it? Was it the, the, the Roman soldiers who, who mocked him? What was it the temple guards who mocked him and beat him? Was it the executioners? Was it those who scorched him and beat him until he was unrecognizable? Was it them that he, the them he was saying, forgive? He was saying, forgive them. But it wasn't just them, it was us. For they know not what they do. Just imagine this. When Pilate said, why are we doing this? I, I find no fault in him. No, crucify him. Crucify him. We know where they came from. Envy, hate, jealousy, fear that he was taking over their positions in this world. We know where that came from. So when Pilate wiped his hands, he said, you know, wash his hands. said, his death is not on me. What did they say? Oh, his blood is on our head and our children's forgive them for they know not what they do they have no idea what they are saying his blood is on our head and our children they're even cursing their children with this nonsense jesus said forgive them for they know not what they do oh that's for me too in 2000 oh forgive her i died on the cross for her she was born into sin she has acted up even after she knew better forgive her amen it's for me it's for you it's for us it's for eternity it's for all generations even after then he said forgive them for they know not what they do i healed i delivered jesus was the prime example of love forgiveness humility compassion meekness kindness Jesus was a perfect example why would forgiveness be any different he was the example of how to forgive with barely breath he brought out father Abba Abba forgive them 
for they know not what they do. The agony was because we didn't know, but the compassion said, forgive them. Even when they mocked him on the cross, while he was yet on the cross, you said you would tear down the temple in three days. You said you were the Messiah. Save yourself. Even with the, the, the thieves on the left and the right side, one was so terrible and unrepentant that he kept saying, I didn't do anything. I don't suppose to be here. Dude, you said you were the Messiah. Get down. Even the criminal. But the one next to him did not because he recognized with a revelation. So before, Pete, before Jesus was brought to the cross, before we got to this point, he shared the Passover with the disciples. And that's when he washed our feet. And of course, Peter, of always Peter, but we love him, you know. God loved him. God, don't wash my feet. No, no. It, 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 you're, you're the Messiah. You shouldn't be washing my feet. I should be washing yours. He said, if I don't do this, you have no part in me. The same Peter that got the revelation that he was indeed Christ got the revelation. Okay, God, wash my feet, but not just my feet, my head too. Jesus said, I ain't got time for that. I got things I got to get done. My hour's short. I finished my race, but there's a few more things I need to talk to you about. Amen. So he said, you have no part. But he said, this I do, you do. For the servant is not greater than the master. Well, that's not just to love when it's easy. That's not just to forgive when it's easy. That's not just to be kind when it's easy. It's to do it when it's hard. When you feel like you're not going to make it out because somebody tried to kill you. When you feel like you're on the last verge of sanity, somebody tried to kill you. But guess what? God kept you. And he did that for a reason. Forgive. If Jesus, who died on the cross, did nothing wrong, there was no fault in him. He was a perfect example of love and mercy and kindness and gentleness and compassion. He was the perfect authority. And he died on the cross. And the first thing he said was, forgive them. You, me, them, all of us. For we know not what we do. If he can say it, we can say it. If he can do it, we can do it. He's the prime example of God, love, and personified. Abba, Father, my God, forgive them for they know not what they do, but I do. That's why I'm dying for them. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. How can we do any less? Follow the example of Christ. If there's someone that you just haven't found it in your heart to forgive, even if they've gone on to be with the Lord, forgive them. Do not let the root of bitterness take his hold upon you because you will miss out on so much, including the peace and joy of God. Including being that example of love and compassion and forgiveness for those who are watching you, even your children. Amen. Follow the example of Christ. Forgive them. He did it. He forgave us. He did nothing but love us, even unto death. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Let's say amen for that wonderful, powerful word from Minister Bissett. So... She kind of tiptoed around my saying, but that's okay, because that's just part of the confirmation that God has us all working together. Amen. So I'm not going to belabor the time. So the saying I have is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, same chapter, verse number 43. And Jesus said unto him, this is the repentant thief, Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So picture this, our Savior dying on the cross. He became, becoming the absorbent of all of our sin. To refer to an old message from a pastor, he became our trash bag. 
But what was so amazing about him is even as he endured heaping all of our filth on him, even as he endured heaping all of everything we've done, said, and thought on him, that even to the point where he was separated from his father in heaven, there, he, he never ceased to be the savior even as he was being sacrificed that even right there in his agony that he could offer salvation to a criminal. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about, let's talk about that. Because Jesus was crucified as a criminal and he was crucified with criminals. But the difference is, is that even though Jesus took on our sin, he didn't become a sinner. According to 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, he became sin. What's the difference? Becoming a sinner would have made him one of us. Becoming sin made him all of us. So he didn't just, he was crucified as one of the criminals, but as sin, he was all of us. He wasn't just, he wasn't just one of us, he was everybody. Just like she said, even as she, he petitioned his father to forgive him for they know what, to, what they do, he became all of us because he died for who? All of us. Thank you, Jesus. And, that, and, and remember that, remember that. He, he died being you, being you, being you, being you, being me. He died as all of us. Remember that this day. So now let's talk about this thief. Because if you read in the same account in the book of Matthew 27 and 44, this thief didn't start out like this. According to that verse, he was right there with everyone else ridiculing Jesus. According to the scripture, they said they were saying the same thing, casting him in their teeth. And I had to look that up because I was like, what does that mean? And basically, another translation said they ridiculed him in the same way, saying the same things. Hey, if you're all that, if you're the Messiah, the Son of God, save yourself. But what happened with this second criminal? I believe that something inside of him in the midst of his ridicule is like, wait a minute. No. Why am I talking about this man like this? Because even his fellow counterpart was like, he's like, you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself and us? And something, and, and I truly believe, because this is what God showed me repentance is. First, it's recognition. Something in that second criminal said, no, wait, 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 wait. Why are we sitting up here ridiculing him? In fact, he told the other criminal, why are you saying this? We're suffering the same fate. It's like, what right do we have? Why? Because he recognized you know what? We deserve to be here. Because he said that in verse, number, in verse number 40 and 41. He said, how are you to say this considering we're dealing with the same persecution? He said, because what, why we're here, we have every right to be here. We are guilty. We deserved our fate. But he also recognized who Jesus was because he said, even though we deserve our fate, this man has done nothing amiss. What does that mean? He recognized that he was two eyes. First eye, he recognized he was innocent. He said, this man has done no wrong to be on this cross with us. We deserve to be here. We messed up. We deserve our fate. He does not. He does not deserve the fate that we have. But the second thing he recognized, and this is the most important I, he recognized him as Emmanuel. Because when he referred to Jesus in verse 42, he said of him, Lord. So who is it that is reserved the title of Lord but God himself? So even in his dying, this thief recognized that he was in the midst of God. And like I said, I truly believe that in this moment, he was like, you know what? He's like, you know what? Forgive me. I'm up here telling you to save me, but you know what? I deserve my fate. But Lord, remember me. 
That, that, and there was something in him that obviously saw the compassion of Jesus that realized, you know what? I may not be able to escape this fate, but maybe, just maybe, I can escape the death that comes afterward. Maybe, just maybe, though I cannot escape the, my death on the cross, maybe, just maybe, I can escape the death of hell. And something in him recognized, I'm with Emmanuel. So you know what, Lord? Forgive me. I know that I blew it, but can you remember me? Can you remember me? And Jesus' response to this repentant thief, this thief that realized he blew it and I deserve to die. He said, you know what? Just because you recognize me, you will be with me in paradise. And, and what's so beautiful, he didn't say that, you know, he, he didn't say it'll be one day. He said today, today that you will be with me in paradise. So why is this so powerful to us today? Because if any of you are like me, you have a whole lifetime of slip ups, mess ups and screw ups. But there is still grace enough from Calvary to say, Lord, I blew it. Forgive me. Lord, I blew it. But remember me. Because you know what, Lord? I know I blew it. And, and that's where you have to be honest with yourself. Be okay with saying, God, I messed up. Help me. God, I messed up again. Help me. Because the wonderful thing about us 1 John 1 and 9 assures us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of every sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and one thing that I always hear, if you slip up, don't give up. Don't give up. Look up. Look up. And ask him, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And trust me, he will. Because he wants to say to you what he said to that thief. And just know that you can have confidence that whatever day it is, whether it be today, tomorrow, you will be with him in paradise. Remember. Remember him. God bless you. Y'all should have a notepad. It's some good nuggets being dropped right now. <laughs> not just cliches, not just words, but life tools. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Great are you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
given honor. Hallelujah. The last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And I have the third saying. Can I be myself? Hallelujah. John 19, verses 26 and 27. It says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Here is Jesus hanging on an old rugged cross, wounded, whipped, bruised, broken, ridiculed, mocked, bleeding, scorned, and dying. I want you to picture that. He's dying. But in all of this, he looks among the people standing at the foot of the cross and he sees Mary, his mother. And Jesus is thinking about his duty to his mom and his responsibility as a son, the eldest son. See, Jesus was both human and God. You see, Jesus never shirked his human responsibilities in favor of divinity. Hear what I'm saying. For as a young child, 12 years of age, the Bible records an exchange between the two, Jesus and his mother, Mary. For after celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem, and after a day's journey home to Nazareth, Mary and Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, began to recognize that Jesus was not among them in the caravan. And they began to frantically search for the presumed lost child. And once they discovered that he is not amongst the caravan, but on their journey back to Jerusalem, and upon finding him after three long days, Jesus is still in Jerusalem in the temple sitting amongst the Jewish teachers, both hearing them and asking questions. And quite naturally, Mary is a bit put off by the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? But the thing of it is, is that uh, Mary just being a mama, okay? So keep in mind, Mary is the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is a child. So she's a bit, she's a bit put off, you know. And so uh, she's put off by this entire ordeal. And then Mary begins to question Jesus. You know, she begins to bombard him with, with where were you? Did you not know? All of that, all of that. And, and, and then Jesus' response to his mother's persistent mode of questioning with an incidental, why were you looking for me? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? And I can, imagine, I can imagine Mary looking at him because the Bible said that she really didn't say anything, but she was amazed. And I can imagine that she looked at him and wanted to say, say what now? <laughs> Excuse me? But this is the thing. Mary must have forgot. The Bible says she began to ponder these things in her heart. That means she began to think think about some things and then she must have said you know what he is the son of God isn't he yeah. hold on wait a minute I was visited by an angel who told me as a virgin that I was going to conceive I did not get this child of a man 
So she had to think about these things, and she was like, okay. But the Bible also says that Jesus was subject to them, and he went home. He was subject. So he did not shirk his divinity. He let Mary know, yeah, mom, let me, let me put you in remembrance. I, need, I just need to tell you this. You need to remember who I am, but I'm going to go home. I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to go home. Hallelujah, and I'm going to do what I'm told. All right, all right, all right. So, <laughs> so the Bible said that he was subject and he went down to Nazareth. Hallelujah. So as a devoted son, bound by Jewish tradition and custom, it was now time for Jesus to commit the care of his divinely appointed mother Mary into the care of another. My subject is an exchange of care. One of the most enduring and beautifully expressed acts of love and compassion was when Jesus uttered these noble sayings, woman, and that is not an insult to Mary to call her woman. It's a term of endearment. Dear woman, behold, hallelujah, thy son. And to the disciples standing by whom he loved, his friend, John, the one that did not desert him, but the one that stayed close. He stayed close. He said to him, behold thy mother, an exchange of care. Now, here's the thing. Mary had other children. Mary had other children. So why didn't Jesus commit the care of his mother into their hands? We know she had other children because the Bible says in Matthew 13, 55 and 56, when he, Jesus, came to his own country, they were amazed with his knowledge and said, is this not the carpenter's son? <laughs> and is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judah, and his sisters, are they not all here with us? Where's this man, this kind of knowledge? Where he coming from? Hallelujah. But little did they know that God does exactly what he wants to do. He does exactly what he sees fit to do. Hallelujah. And this is how Jesus responds at another instance when informed that his mother and his brother were standing outside desiring to see him. I'm closing. In Mark's gospel, chapter 3, verse 33, it says, And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother? Who is my brethren? Hallelujah. And then he said, and he looked about them which sat around like I'm looking at you. Hallelujah. Picture yourself. He said, he said, these are my mother and my brethren. These that do the will of my father. These are my mother and my brethren. Hallelujah. Whoever shall do the will of God. The same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So listen, it is not always about one's pedigree. Hallelujah. It's not about your mom. It's not about your daddy and your brother and your sister and who your granny and granddad was. Hallelujah. But it's a about the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Hallelujah. This was makes us brethren. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So as I leave you with these words of Psalms 75, 6 and 7, it says, for a promotion cometh not, far, not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is is the judge and he put it down one and he set it up another in Christ Jesus we have a new family hallelujah praise the Lord everybody praise the Lord everybody
you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O lord my strength and my redeemer amen if you could turn your bibles to matthew the 27th chapter amen verse number 46 and it reads as such and about the ninth hour jesus cried with a loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani which means my god my god why have thou forsaken me when you know you need help and you hurt you ain't gonna be silent with it you gonna cry with a lord help me because i'm standing in the need of prayer so i called on google and I asked Google, Google, what does forsaken mean? To renounce or entirely turn away. So I began to read about different people. And Whitley Woolett said like this. This is how she describes this verse. She states that this verse expresses the depth and horror of what Jesus was suffering. In that moment, Jesus was plunged into an outer darkness away from his father's presence to bear the sins of the world. This verse screams out the way Jesus was feeling in his physical body to me was in such a great weight of pain and agony that no amount, now if you appeal, Papa, okay, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen don't work. If you are a Vicodin person, it don't work. Percocet, 15 to 30 milligrams every four hours of morphine did not help or could not help Jesus. Even those that like their Tylenol were coding. It was not enough to endure what Jesus was doing on the cross. But Isaiah 53 and 5 says, he said he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes that means every whipping he got. The Bible says, he says, I'm healed. Pam, you're healed. On this account, this verse screams out with a loud voice. Crying Jesus, feeling disowned, ignored, isolated, taunt, shunned, beyond hurt. Because the presence of his father was no longer with him was no longer to be found. But the Bible even concludes in Matthew, the 27. And if you read one verse, oh, even the earth has something to say. He said, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. The earth had something to say about Jesus being on the cross. Jesus who was without sin for the sins of the world with that being said this verse Jesus cried out with a loud voice my God my God why have thou forsaken me do you want to know why I'm glad you asked on the cross Jesus became the backbiter he became the covenant breaker he became the envy and the jealousy he became the idolatry and the inventories of evil things greed and deceit and prideful just in case if i didn't mark your sin just say out you'll have mercy now when you get to yours just say that for me unforgiving gossipers vanity liars and slanders witchcraft strife solomon come on let's start from there back in the beginning when adam and eve sinned he covered them too perjuring pornography oh come on some of y'all just got saved from that loneliness gluttony addictions adultery disobedient out lost out
Oh, maybe that was just for me. But he became it. So just in case you didn't know, every drug dealer say out. Every pill papa say out. If you in hell, say out. That was your sin. If you ran with the drug dealer, say out. If you watched him cut up dope, say out. Ouch. Every disobedient child need to say ouch. Because he did it. So just in case you didn't know why he was forsaken, it was because of us. And I messed up selves. He bore it on the cross. He had your name on it. From over 200 and thousands of years ago, your name was written in blood. He knew you was coming down the channel. So he bore all of your sins. So don't be a hang up. Don't put yourself down. But it's on the cross. All you got to do is run. Somebody say yeah. Somebody say yeah. yeah. Woo! Ha. Well, I ain't gonna slow it down. And Jesus, knowing these things, that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Somebody say, I thirst. Well, this thirst wasn't about his humanity because Jesus was divine. This thirst was not about his weakness because he was not human at this point. This thirst, somebody say this thirst. This thirst was about the fulfillment of scriptures because Jesus understood that every scripture had to be fulfilled. He came to fulfill the word of God. So Jesus recognizing all the way back from Genesis, working his way up to Calvary, he went through and said, well, wait a minute, there's one scripture that's left. Uh, what's that scripture? I thirst, somebody say I thirst. That scripture is found over in Psalm 69, uh, verses 19 and 21. Uh, Jesus knew that his suffering uh, would foretell hallelujah uh, and satisfy all the reproach, all of the shame, all of the dishonor, the adversary relationship with God, uh, the brokenheartedness that we carry, uh, the heaviness and the lack of pity that we have, uh, the lack of comfort that we can receive. Uh, Jesus said, I thirst. Somebody say, I thirst. As Matthew mentioned in his commentary, uh, by this Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and that not only was this scripture punctually filled uh, by Jesus on the cross, uh, but it also said that it was strictly eyed by him. Uh, by this God uh, and Jesus is the truth. Hallelujah. Uh, all that Jesus did on the cross uh, was fulfilled at this moment. Somebody say, I thirst. Uh, I don't know about you, but hallelujah, the cross and sin dehydrates us. Sin draws from us. Hallelujah. Disobedience draws from us. Disobedience places us in a place of dehydration. Our bodies can't deal with sin. It cannot deal with the struggle of this world. It cannot deal with the sickness of this life. Somebody say, I thirst. Somebody say, I thirst. So I got a real big question for you. What are you thirsty for? Look at your neighbor and say, why are you thirsty? Why are you thirsty? Hallelujah. I know there's some thirsty people in here today. I know there's some thirsty individuals in here today. You're walking in this world without the water. 
you're walking in this world without the true water uh, hallelujah jesus said uh, over in john 7 and 37 uh, he said if any man thirst uh, let him come after me uh, and let him drink uh, you don't have to thirst today uh, isaiah 55 and 1 says uh, come unto me all you are thirsty uh, and hallelujah come you don't need to bring nothing uh, i already got what you need uh, isaiah 12 and 3 says uh, come ye who are thirsty uh, and drink with water uh, drink with joy uh, draw from the water from the well of salvation uh, i'm gonna leave you with this last thing uh, hallelujah when jesus uh, was talking to the woman at the well now uh, you remember the Sarah married woman uh, that came to the well uh, and jesus is sitting there uh, there are three things that jesus did uh, three things that he said uh, to fulfill the thirst uh, he said hallelujah uh, if you knew the gift of god uh, you would have asked him uh, and he would have given you water uh, i want to ask you today uh, do you know the gift of calvary uh, do you know the gift of the cross uh, do you know the gift of today uh, if you knew the gift of jesus uh, you would come down here today uh, the second thing he said uh, whoever drinks of this water uh, that i give them uh, will never thirst again uh, tell your neighbor you don't have to thirst uh, you don't have to leave her parched uh, you don't have to leave her dehydrated uh, you don't have to leave it the same way uh, jesus got more water uh, than the world could ever give you uh, jesus got more water uh, than your friends could ever give you uh, i know they walked out on you uh, but jesus got water uh, the last thing jesus said to the woman uh, the water that i give you uh, it shall be in you uh, a well of water uh, springing up into everlasting life uh, and i got news for you uh, it ain't just about this life uh, because one day we all got to go uh, and stand before the judge uh, and i don't know about you uh, but i want everlasting life uh, i want the water that springs up uh, into everlasting life Life. somebody say why are you thirsty when there's everlasting life why are you parched when there's everlasting life why are you dehydrated when there's everlasting life tell your neighbor come on turn to your neighbor turn to your neighbor tell them you don't have to leave you thirsty because Jesus said I thirst
because I got 10 minutes and I got, so let me get started. Don't, don't nick me for the worship, okay? <laughs> okay, I've been, I've been designated to talk about the sixth saying is found in John 19, the 19th chapter in the 30th verse. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When I read this verse, I thought, I said, Lord, what can I say that hasn't already been said about the sixth saying, specifically in how it relates to the world? Now, the seven sayings of Jesus came from the Gospels, and there are four Gospels that we know, and each portrays Jesus differently. However, they, are, they, are, they don't contradict each other, but they complement each other. Amen? Because they cover the life, the ministry, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, referred to as the synoptic gospels because of their similarities in language and miracles and events. But John's gospel is somewhat different because his focus is on the deity of Jesus, the eternal son of God who came to bring eternal life to all who believe. So when you read John 19 and verse 30, you have to understand the verse in the full context of the entire book of John. So what are you saying? Well, when a runner participates in a marathon or cross-country race, he is focused on the finish line. However, the race also has a starting point. So when you're reading John 19, verse 30, it is finished. You have to follow John's theme and read the scripture in concert with John 1 and 1, which says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was true in the beginning with God. Verse 14 goes on to say, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Consequently, understanding that when a person starts a race, before reaching the finish line, you cannot forget the journey that began from the starting point, which applies to John 19, verse 30. So where are you going with this, Dr. Fields? Well, according to recent studies, and stay with me now, according to recent studies conducted by various research institutions on near-death experiences and dying, before a person dies, their entire life flashes before 
for them. This is scientific, so I need you to follow me. Right before death, researchers have recorded that before and after the heart stops beating, brain waves show increased activity in parts of the brain associated with memory recall, suggesting that at death, a person's brain replays memories. So memories are being replayed in the brain until a person's, until a person's complete demise. So following this train of thought leads us to believe that when John wrote, it is finished, he recognized that this was a vital moment in human history. He knew that Jesus was the Christ prophesied throughout the Old Testament. However, he did not expound on or explain the totality or define the significance of Jesus' statement, it is finished. Because Jesus' journey to the cross did not start on the hill of Golgotha. As Jesus was dying on the cross and God manifested in the flesh, he hung there bleeding from the beatings, the thorns on his head, and the nails in his hands. And as he went in and out of consciousness, the memories of his, this journey to the cross replayed going all the way back to, back to the Garden of Eden. He saw the thread of redemption and salvation that began before eternity he saw Moses write Genesis 1 and 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth he saw the thread of redemption unfold when he created Adam and Eve in his image distinguishing them from all created beings he saw the thread of redemption unfold when Adam and Eve disobeyed him and ate the forbidden fruit breaking his heart but because of love for humanity he proclaimed to Satan in the entire world in Genesis 3 and 15 that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That day had finally come to pass. Jesus had a playback of the flood and when he promised to preserve the order of the world so that the work of redemption could be accomplished. When he said it is finished, Jesus saw the thread of redemption unfold when he called Abraham to leave his homeland and promise to multiply his offspring spring and through his descendants all nations would be blessed preparing the way for the Messiah Jesus had a playback while he hung on the cross and he saw the redemption plan continue to unfold when he heard the cries of his people in Egypt and he called Moses he called Moses from the burning bush met him on Mount Sinai he wrote the Ten Commandments needed to shape Israel into a single nation so that through them all the nations would be blessed when Jesus said it is finished he saw the redemptive plan unfold when he promised David that he would build his throne for all generations and that David's offspring would be the king forever ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters when Jesus said it was finished he heard the prophets of old warning the Israelites to repent and return to God he had a playback of the intertestamental period represent the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament and during this period oh Jesus the heavens went silent for 400 years and no prophets were called and God revealed nothing to the Jewish people when Jesus said it's finished he heard the echoes of the prophets throughout the ages regarding his coming when Jesus said it is finished he had a playback of the redemption plan of salvation that took 42 generations before the angel met Mary in the garden letting her know that she was chosen to to carry the Messiah Jesus had a playback of John the Baptist preaching repentance paving the way for his ministry when Jesus said it is finished he had a playback of the miracles performed during his three and a half year ministry yet he was still rejected by the world he was rejected by the nation from which he came he was rejected by his family and he was even rejected by some of the disciples when Jesus said it is finished he had a playback of when he went to the garden of Gethsemane to pray to the father that he removed the cup so that his will would be done when Jesus said it is finished
finished. He had a playback of Judas betraying him and the soldiers arresting him like he was a criminal. Jesus had a playback when he was taken to the high priest at the Sanhedrin council and accused of blasphemy. When he said it is finished, he saw the redemptive plan of salvation unfolding and his tortured and bloody body standing in the judgment hall before Pilate then sent to Herod and returned to Pilate where he was sentenced to death to death like a convict and then led away to Calvary ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters when Jesus said it is finished it was not a cry of defeat but of triumph and victory because of the journey that the Garden of Eden that led him to the cross as Jesus cried out it is finished as his accusers looked on it was not the despairing cry of a helpless martyr it was the voice of the Messiah our captain of salvation the conqueror of sin death and Satan so as he hung on the cross and he said it is finished this statement represented the long shadow of the cross that it reached back to the Garden of Eden and his cry it is finished signified uh, oh his successful completion of his work all the sacrifices of the old Jewish law were now abolished complete atonement had been made and condemn condemnation was removed uh, we can now boldly we can go boldly to the throne of grace uh, oh we can go boldly to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy uh, oh it is finished all the prophecies uh, and promises were now fully accomplished in Christ it is finished uh, the power of Satan sin and death are destroyed uh, it is finished we are healed from our brokenness uh, because he imparted healing to all humanity we have been made righteous uh, and can, can participate in his holiness which is our sanctification the ransom of man's debt of guilt was paid the reconciliation between God and man was established and peace was reinstated he paid the penalty for our sins uh, and he took our lives and bore our punishment oh we are freed from our sinful nature it is finished the power of sin oppression sickness and any offspring of sin has been broken it is finished our old life is dead and our new life in Christ has begun we are no longer foreigners but have received the spirit of adoption by whom we now cry Abba Father it is finished we are now assured of our salvation which serves to strengthen our faith and strengthen our hope to endure unto the end saints it is finished praise the lord it is finished my assignment comes from the gospel of luke chapter 23 verse number 46 and when jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands i commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the ghost now when the then centurion saw what was done he glorified god saying certainly this indeed was a righteous man it was finished but it wasn't final come with me to golgotha as jesus hangs on on the cross he hangs there between agony because of the sin of Adam, but the expectancy of the promise of salvation. Jesus is on the cross. He, he knew full well that uh, the disobedience of the first Adam, which separated us from God, would now be ratified as his obedience to death would bring us back into the presence of the Lord and he would redeem all mankind yeah Jesus is on the cross he he hangs on this old rugged tree to die to bring eternal life because Adam had sinned and by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good of evil yet Jesus hangs on the tree as a fruit of righteousness to the father 
In fact, every stage of this redemptive act was righteously paralleling to the unrighteous acts of Adam. Consider this, that Jesus hung as a savior uh, in the place of Adam who stood as a sinner. Uh, G Jesus hung, giving these seven last words because of the conversation that God had with Adam, summed up in seven words. Thou shalt not eat of this tree. It is not finished. I mean, it's finished, but it is not, it is not final. Uh, he hangs as the fulfillment of the tree in contrast to the fruit taken from the tree. We're in the garden now. He hangs having been pierced in his side till blood and water came out to signify to Eve, even though you violated the word of God, even though you took from the fruit and gave to your husband, you as the rib that came out of his side, I'm going to be pierced in my side to let you know you're included in the redemption. He hangs here on this cross with nails in his hands uh, to demonstrate uh, that those hands that took from the tree will now be redeemed through my hands being nailed on this cross in this act of redemption. His feet are nailed to this cross to signify that it, is, that it is better to be obedient, to be in the place that God has told you than to be kicked out of the garden. It is finished, but it's not final. He even hangs on this cross between two male factors, two thieves, to signify that this began in the garden because of the work of Adam and the work of Eve, trying to hide privately, God asks Adam, where, where art thou? Where he, he's been banished from the garden. He's been kicked out uh, because of his sin. And uh, Adam is trying to privately hide. And brother Abraham, God says to him, where art thou? But Jesus hangs on this tree publicly and willingly. And he says, no man has taken my life from me. I lay it down and I will freely lift it up. Finally, he hangs on this cross with a crown of thorns piercing uh, his head, symbolizing the, cur the curse of creation that said that there will be thorns and thistles because of your violation of my word. Lastly, he hangs bleeding uh, uh, from this brutal scourging that has taken place. We, we, we don't really look into the depths of this scourging, but this scourging was a, a brutal, painful act. They would take a strips of leather and put nails and glass and rocks, and as he would get whipped, uh, parts of his skin would be ripped off. As he would get whipped, his flesh would break and the blood would spew. As he would get whipped, uh, parts of his body would be damaged to tell you that the mangling of my body represents the mangling of your sin he hangs there bleeding on the cross of Calvary you have to understand that Hebrews 9 22 says that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin he could declare that it's finished but until he died it's not final so Jesus hangs on this old rugged tree between the agony of punishment of sin and the ecstasy of the promise of salvation. Our Lord has already uttered these words, these final words, it is finished. Now he utters a committed word to the Father which declares into your hands, I commit my spirit. To the unbelieving crowd, these words, Brother John, were the words of a sufferer. To the unbelieving crowd, they saw him as a sufferer. But for those who were waiting for the promised Messiah, they heard these words as a savior. But to the ears of his father, he heard the words of a son, a sufferer, a savior, and a son. Same words, different perspective. So the blood had to be shed 
but the fullness of redemption to occur, Jesus still had, he had to die. To those who heard this suffering Jesus, uh, they, they were right. They were right that he was suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we're healed. So if you heard it as a sufferer, you're right. But if you heard it as a savior, you're also right. Because he said, if I be lifted up. I'll draw all men unto my, to myself. And if you heard it uh, as the son, as the father did, you're right. Because he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. So God is now hearing these words from the portals of heaven. Father, into your hands I commend or I commit my spirit. Jesus had already experienced the hands of the betrayer. You remember when he sat with uh, his disciples and he says, the hand of he that will betray me is at the table. Jesus had heard, uh, had experienced the hand uh, of the people uh, uh, and the chief priests as they bullied him, saying, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Jesus had experienced the hands of the governors that beat him. And lastly, Jesus had experienced the hands of the Roman soldiers that brutalized him he had been in the hands of a betrayer he had been in the hands of a, bu a bully he had been in the hands of a betrayer a bully a brutalizer and someone had beat him but now he's needing to die. now he's needing to lay down his life now he's needing to give up his goals and with one cry he cries unto the father into your hands I commend my spirit can I suggest to you that the best place the safest place the securest place to be is in the hands of the Lord in the hands of the Lord number one God's hands are strong. He will uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness. It's the strength of God's hand that keep you. The second thing you need to understand about God's hands is that God's hands are safe. You may have been brutalized in other hands. You may have been uh, 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 maimed in other hands. But if you are in the hands of the Lord, you are safe. Other hands may have misused you. Other hands may have abused you. Other hands may have maligned you. But if you're in the hands of God, you're, you're, you're safe. God's hands are also stable. God's hands will keep you. That's why Jude says, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. The reason why, Brother Tim, you haven't gone back into the world is because the stabilizing hand has kept you. The reason why, Brother Jamal, you don't do what you used to do is because the stabilizing hands of God keeps you. Lastly, God's hands are shalom field hands it's hands that give you peace it's hands that will comfort you uh, in your storm it's his hands that will uh, give you a peace that passes all understanding let me uh, close this by telling you it began in the garden but it went to Gethsemane ultimately it went to Golgotha and it ends in glory as Jesus said father into your hands I commend my spirit and he died and gave up the ghost he is now glorified as the anointed king he is now glorified as the bright and morning star he is now glorified as the conquering king he's now glorified as the day star he's now glorified as Emmanuel God with us he He's glorified as the faithful one. He's glorified as the holy one. He's glorified as the I am that I am. He's glorified as Jesus, he who came through 42 generations and he died and gave up the ghost. I submit to you that if Jesus can commit his hands to the Father, you should be able to commit your hands to the Father. It's the Father's hands that have kept you when you were on a bed of affliction. It's not the doctor that healed you. It's not the medicine that healed you. It was a hand of the Lord. It was a hand of the Lord that stopped the enemy from taking you out. It was a hand of the Lord 
Lord that stopped you from dying. It was the hand of the Lord that stopped the bullet from coming and taking you out. Father, into your hand, your amazing hand, your strong hand, your sound hand, your sure hand, your firm hand, your holy hand, your merciful hand, your gracious hand, your good hand, into your hand, I commend my spirit. graves into gardens. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Give God a hand praise. Oh, come on, let's celebrate him. Come on, let's clap our hands. We can do better than that. Oh, come on, this is Resurrection Sunday. This is Resurrection Sunday. We are here today, not because Jesus died. We're here today because he's alive. We're not here because he just died. We are here because he is alive. Woo! Give God a hand praise. He's alive. This is Resurrection Sunday. We've heard the seven sayings of Jesus while on the cross. We've heard it. And I, I, I like the last part as it, uh, Elder Freeman preach, finish, but not final. When he got up, he was in the grave for three days and three nights. The work was finished, but it wasn't final. It wasn't final until Jesus got up from the grave and declared that all power is in my hand. He got up. He got up. He died. And defeated the power of sin died defeated the penalty of sin died and defeated the presence of sin and now today we can celebrate today this is a celebration we are celebrating the fact that he got up from the grave yeah he died but he got up from the grave he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquity the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed my praise is healed. My joy is healed. My hope is, oh, my hope is healed. My future is healed because of what Jesus did at the cross. Because of this glorious resurrection. We have had a wonderful sermon. We have wonderful sermon. Ads. Let's give God a praise for what we have heard. He got up. He got up from the grave. 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock p.m. From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. He hung on the cross. He didn't die from suffocation. He didn't have an aneurysm. Didn't have a heart attack on the cross. The reason why he died from Hebrews 9 and 22 is because he bled to death. He bled to death at Calvary. Woo! He bled for you. He bled for me. Because he loved me so much. Look, look I'm going to ask you to come to the Lord. But this, this is not about religion. When Jesus came on the earth, there were all kinds of religions all over the place. Lots of religion in Egypt, in Israel. Religion was everywhere. But what did not exist was a relationship. Ooh, a relationship with God. He died so that we could have a relationship with him. Not just a relationship but he died that we might have eternal life. Everybody gets two dates. You get a date that you're born and a date that you die. You only get two dates. And you don't have a lot of control over either one of those dates. A date to be born is a date to die. But what you do between the two dates will determine eternity where you spend eternity. I want to invite somebody to Jesus. I want to invite someone to Jesus on this resurrection morning. He loves you so much. He died for you. And he's coming back. I want to invite someone to Jesus. He loved you. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about our relationship with Jesus. That he becomes Lord of your life. He, he walks with you. He comforts you. He leads you. He guides you. This process is very simple. You believe the story. You believe the story of his death. 
You believe the story of his resurrection. You believe the story that he's coming back one day. You believe the story. He died, didn't he? He was in the grave for three days, wasn't he? He's coming back, isn't he? What are you going to do? I want to invite you to Jesus. You first believe in his death, his burial, his resurrection. You believe. And then you say, I want to repent. I want to turn. I want to turn towards him. Look, you fall in love with Jesus. He will impact your desires. He, he will give you a new taste bud. He'll give you a new appetite, a new desire. When you repent, God gives you a desire to turn towards him. Who here today on this Easter morning wants to turn your direction? Everything else has failed. But I want to invite you to a man named Jesus. Anybody here today prepared to say, I want to change. I'm at the church of change and I want to change in my life. I believe there's somebody here. I want you to come. I want you to come just as you are. You might have some weed in your pocket. You may have some dope in your pocket, but we want you to come just as you are. Come just as you are. Come with your stuff. Come with your issues. Come with your, with your problems because there's a God who can turn your world around. Anybody here today, you repent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm not the son that I ought to be. Anybody feel like that today? I want to change in my life. I'm sorry, God, I'm not in the place I need to be. I want you to come. You want to change in your life? You got to do something different to get a different result. You can't continue to do the same thing expecting a change in your life. You need Jesus. He's a mind regulator. He's a heart fixer. Who here today? If you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, because after you repent, be baptized. You want to go down in Jesus' name. This young lady said, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. I want my insurance policy. When you're baptized in water, it's an insurance policy. The premiums have already been paid. You just got to come. You just got to get up and come. You got to believe and come. You got to come. It says, I want to be covered. That when I die, I want to be assured of eternal life because of what Christ has done for me. You've not been baptized in water in Jesus' name. I want you to come. One young lady is already going down. We're going to baptize her today. We're going to baptize her now. We're going to baptize her. We, prepared to, we are prepared to baptize you in water today. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. God has a plan for you. You come. Please come. This is the God that loves you so much. He has the Holy Spirit for you. He promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Not only are you being baptized, he will give you the Holy Ghost. And you will praise him in a new language. He'll give you some new tongues. He'll give you a new praise. He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's how he'll fill you up. He'll fill you. Anybody want the Holy Ghost? You want the Holy Spirit. She going down in Jesus' name. She going, she's going down in Jesus' name. She's going down in water. She can't wait. I got to go today. What about you? Please come. I'm not asking you at this point, not now to join the church. What I'm asking you now is to give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. I will invite you to this church, but first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. Two people are going down in Jesus' name. Two are going down. Two are going down in Jesus' name. Two have made a critical decision today. I'm going down and I'm being baptized in water today. What about you, brother? What about you, sister? 
He loves you so much. He died for you. You're seeking the Holy Spirit. And you're seeking the Holy Spirit. Allow these ministers to come and lay hands on you. And let's believe God. We'll believe God with you. You're seeking the Holy Spirit. And you desire the Holy Spirit. These ministers are standing here with their hands stretched forth. Signifying to come. Come. Somebody here today seeking the Holy Spirit. Somebody here want to get a fresh start. You want to start. You want this day to be a fresh start. You've gotten away from the Lord and you want to get back on track. Please come and let these ministers also pray with you. Jesus was not ashamed when he went to the cross. You should be ashamed. They beat him. They put a thorns of crowns on his hat. They pierced him. He was not ashamed. You should not be ashamed to come and allow God to redirect you. If you've gotten away from the Lord, I want you to come. If you're not where you need to be, I want you to come. If you're seeking a breakthrough, I want you to come. We believe in touching and agreeing in this church. I want you to come. Please come. He would not come down. He would not come down from. Please come. They're coming. They're coming. Come on, come on, come on. The Holy Ghost is waiting for you. The waters are waiting for you. He will change your life. He decided to die. Please come. He would not come down. He wouldn't come down. They hung him high, stretched him wide, but he wouldn't come down. You ought to come down. You ought to come down because Jesus would not come down. Please come. Thank you, Father. He loves you. Please come. Just to save me. Please come, please come. This could be your resurrection. It's Resurrection Sunday. Whatever is dead, the Lord can make live again. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's the Sunday that reminds us that God can cause things to live again. Resurrection Sunday. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, he wouldn't come down. He wouldn't come down. He wouldn't come down. He went to Calvary. You ought to come. She's going down in Jesus' name. She wants to go down in Jesus' name. Take her to the waters. Three people are going down. Three people are going down in Jesus' name. The Holy Ghost is available. Got the praise. He decided to come. He decided to die for you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. Thank you, ministers. You may be seated. Amen. 
What a word today. Woo! What a word. Did not our hearts burn? What a word from the Lord. I'm, I'm more encouraged. I'm, I'm more encouraged to walk with Jesus. I said, I'm more encouraged to walk with Jesus. I said, I'm more encouraged to walk with Jesus. I was telling Lady D the other day ago, I said, you know, it's been 60, 60 years since I've been baptized. I was baptized 60 years ago. 60 years ago, I was baptized. And she said, you sure the date is right? I said, yeah. 60 years. Never regretted it. Never said, man, I should have done it. I should have done it. Man, man. 60 years. I said yes to him. So when they came to me and asked me if I want to do some drugs or steal some cars, nah, you too late. You too late. I, I know a man from Galilee. I mentioned earlier in the Christian education, we had Juvenile Center a couple of weeks ago. And one of the juvenile directors said the young people, that 99% of the young people who are incarcerated had never been to anybody's church. They know nothing about church. They have never been to anybody's church. Our young people who are incarcerated. But I'm so glad as a young boy, 60 years ago, I said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Haven't always been perfect and always been on point, but I made my mind 60 years ago, I'm going to follow Jesus. And I've never regretted that decision to say yes to him. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. I'm going to follow Jesus. And, and the other argument, who else you going to follow? If I don't follow Jesus, who, who you going to follow? What if you're wrong? What, what if you're wrong? What if there's no God? What if he ain't coming back, bro? If he's not coming back, I'm good. But let me ask you a question. What if he is coming back? What if he does show up? How are you going to stand? Oh, I got my passport. And I'm ready to go. Let's give God praise one more time for our... Amen. Wonderful job. You all can be seated in the audience you like. Did a wonderful job. I want to thank also to Evangelist Show Oliver for her leadership and preparing our ministers. We have some very fine ministers here, and I'm so honored and proud of the caliber uh, of the ministers that are here at, at Temple Church of Christ. They don't just preach. They, they do a lot of other things in the community, and I'm so grateful that God has blessed this church with a whole bunch of good ministers. I'm really, really grateful. Well, we have, I believe, three people who, who want to be baptized today. Uh, we don't delay. We don't baptize uh, two months from now, three months from now. If you want to go and you're ready to go, we'll baptize you now if you're ready to go. And today, I believe we have at least three who are going to be baptized. And while they're preparing, we have announcements that we're going to. I'm still fired up from these messages, man. This was so good. All of them. It's true. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Evangelist Oliver, you stepped out, but I want to just come on up, Evangelist Oliver. She's a hard-working lady. She's hard. She's over our minister alliance. This Evangelist Show, Oliver, come on up. I just want to just celebrate you for the work that you're doing in ministry with our minister, ministerial alliance and just have a few remarks. But this woman is a hard-working woman, and I want to say thank you for your help. Praise the Lord, everyone, again. What a marvelous, outstanding preaching we had today. Amen. Glory to God. And the Spirit of the Lord came in. I appreciate and I honor the speakers today that did such a wonderful job. I praise God for our pastor and our first lady that allow us to take the stand and come behind this sacred desk to preach the word. We don't just do it on our own. We can't do it like that. But because of the pastor that we have, that we appreciate, and Lady D, our first lady, and not only them, all of you. Because we come together to work together. 
and to love one another and to build up the kingdom of God. And I appreciate what the Lord is doing in this place. I love to hear the preachers come forth and they are young and mighty and ready to go forth. So I say go forth in the Holy Ghost and preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exalt with all long-suffering and doctrine. That's what we do. And I appreciate Pastor allowing the ministers to go forth today. Thank you, Amen. Thank Bishop. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Evangelist Oliver. Thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing. Can, can we just pause for just a quick testimony? I, I believe that when the resurrection gets a hold of your life, it's not just the event. It is an experience. Something happens to your personality. Uh, Minister Pamela, come on up for a second. I want you to tell us what happened last week and and uh, just share with the congregation. She has a, little, a testimony. It's not a little. It was a big testimony about what the Lord has done for her heart. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'll just make this brief. On, I think it was Thursday, um, I was on my way to pick up my son from school. And as I was driving... It just was raining money. And I said, oh my gosh, is this money flying in the air? So this money is just, so I make a quick U-turn because I just <laughs> drove through the money and it made it just blow up more. I made a, so I'm talking to my sister on the phone and she's like, what? Get me some, get me some. And I'm like, I gotta get off the phone. I, so I jump out of the car and I'm, I, I literally block the street, just a two lane road. And I'm picking up all this money. Then other cars started stopping and they're picking up money. And we're all right at that. I saw the wallet and I picked up the wallet off the ground. And I knew then it was not my blessing from the Lord. It was the person's name that was on the wallet. So then I said, oh my goodness, something has happened to this person. Maybe someone hurt this person. And I thought I saw them throw the wallet out the window or throw it out the window. So there were several people who had picked up this money. And I tell you, when the Holy Ghost is up on you, because it was not me, because these people did not know me, I began to say to the people, give me that money. And not in a way that I was robbing them. I said, give me that. No, we got to give it back. Give me that money. And they started giving me the money. And one man was literally in his truck with a, a, a money in his hand. And he said, I'm good. So he was saying, I got mine and I'm driving. I said, no, sir. I said, no, give me that. We're going to do the right thing. And he said, no, I'm good. And I said, no, give me that money. And he handed it to me and gave it to me. And everyone else and a man said to me, ma'am, that's not your money. And I said, I know it. And it's not yours either. So I, I called the police with all this money on the seat. I called the police to let them know that this money in this wallet was found. And I, I just was thinking maybe someone had hurt this person. And so the police said they were on their way. The police met me and um, took my statement, put it, I didn't even want to touch it. I didn't count it because I was thinking someone's hurt. I don't want my fingerprints on it. And, so, you know, so they put it in the bag and within less than 20 minutes, I got a phone call and the phone call said to me, are you Pamela Mitchell? And I said, yes. She said, the police gave me your name. My husband doesn't do a lot of talking, but I'm calling for him. And we just want to thank you because we didn't think that there were many honest people in the world, but we were just counseling. Oh, also it was credit cards our credit cards and I didn't she didn't say if they got all the money or how much it was but in estimated it after I went back and started looking on my pictures that I took I said it was somewhere between three and five hundred dollars that I could have used but I knew that I had to do the right thing I did not say to the woman that I was saved or sanctified or Holy Ghost filled but I knew that it was not my blessing because my blessings come from the Lord so I knew that that money did not belong to me. And if I had lost it, I wish that someone would give it back to me. So I received this card in the mail that said, Dear Pamela, 
You have single-handedly restored my faith in humanity. There are still good people out there, and you, and you are absolutely one of the best. My husband and I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You are an angel, which I'm not. I'm just a human. And they signed their name. P.S. I hope that the good you did today is restored to you someday. The good I did is restored to me because that did not belong to me. And my blessings come from the Lord. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Power just a moment. So, so as I understand it, that when the, the gentleman went to the bank, he had his wallet, put his wallet on top of the car as he opened up the car and stepped into his car and drove off and left his wallet on top of the car. And as he drove away, that's when the wallet fell off and hit the street and dollars were all over the place. And uh, Evangelist Pamela sent me pictures of all this money. It looked like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But I believe that resurrection is not just an event. It affects your heart. And we, we sympathize and empathize with others as well. And I want to thank you for letting the Holy Ghost use you because you could have taken the money and the credit cards. Amen. But when the Holy Spirit takes on you, uh, takes root in your heart, you do the right thing. Can we give God praise for the Holy Spirit who leads and directs us? Amen. Hey, we got some good news. We're going to baptize some people in Jesus' name. This is good news. They will never, ever be required to be baptized again. You only get baptized one time in your life, just really one time in your life. And these individuals have come to be baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus on Easter Sunday. We're going to bury them into his death, and it's going to be a wonderful resurrection that's coming up in, the, in his likeness. Amen? Father, we celebrate you. We thank you for these souls who have responded to the call. We thank you for your death, burial, and your resurrection and how you have touched their hearts today to say, yes, I'm giving my life to you by the way of the water. Now, God, I pray you bless them, strengthen them, encourage them, fill them with the Holy Ghost and give them power, stickability, power, power and power to stand and to be strong in your faith. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 My dear sister, Miracle, do you believe that Jesus died? Yes. Do you believe he was buried? Yes. Do you believe he rose again? Yes. It's based upon the confession of your faith and the confidence that you have in the blessed word of life concerning the death, burial, and grand resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll now baptize you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> What the world says about me, been down in Jesus' name. So glad I've been down in Jesus' name. So glad I've been down in Jesus' name. Oh, I don't care what the world says about me. Jesus died. Yes. Do you believe he's buried? Yes. Do you believe he rose? Yes. Do you believe he's coming back? Yes. It's based upon the confession of your faith and the confidence that you have in the blessed word of life concerning the death, burial, and grand resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I now baptize you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So glad I've been down in Jesus' name. Oh, 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 I don't care what the world says about me. Been down in Jesus' name. So glad I've been down in Jesus' name. So glad I've been down in Jesus' name. Oh, 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 I don't care what the world says about me. 
confidence that you have in the blessed word of life concerning the death, burial, and grand resurrection of our Lord and Savior that I now indeed baptize you in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Bend down in Jesus' name. Bend down in Jesus' name. So glad I'm so glad I I'm so excited today. Sam, come on up here, Sam. This is... Come on up. This is, this is Sam, my only son, my youngest child. And I'm so happy to see him. Remember I told you about Sam got shot in the back? He was on the floor, and the guy went... Shot Sam once in the back, and the bullet did not go into Sam's back. I have the shirt in my closet where the doctors, they rip, the, they rip it open because there's a key log in his back, but the bullet did not penetrate his body. And, and every time I look at that shirt, I say, God, thank you. Thank you. I've been praying for my son to come back. Come on back. He got everything he needs. He played the piano. He read notes. He just, I mean, he's gifted. And God's going to bless him. I believe that in Jesus' name. So when I say pray for my son, my boy. Oh. Uh. It's an honor to be here. Um, like my dad said, I've been through a lot of things, and I just love just the the, the energy when I come. And uh, I know my dad wants me to be more consistent with coming, so that's what I'm working on this year. And uh, I just appreciate everybody, and it's uh, all love. All right. And not only are you praying for my son, but we're praying for your son and your daughter as well. Amen. That God will help them. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough world out there now. It's a tough, tough, tough world. It's tough. And we thank God for all of our, our children, those in church, those out of church. Let's pray for all of our children. Can we clap our hands one more time for God's goodness and his mercy? Amen. Our time is for a spin. We're a little bit over, but we're going to move on with our announcements. Millicent, it's good to see you. Jennifer, I want to see you before you go. Um, if you'll come and have our remarks, they will be shortly dismissing. And to those of you who are visiting, the good news is that we carry on like this every Sunday. So come on back. The mission statement of TCOC is that we swim, we serve, share, worship, win souls, intercede, and make disciples for Christ. Some of the ways in which we swim are shown in our following announcements. Christian Education Sunday School classes are at 9 a.m. Sunday morning worship service at 10.30 a.m. Monday night prayer at 7 p.m. Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. 
fasting every Wednesday from 12.01 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Thursday, Teen Prayer Line at 7 p.m. Victorious Living, Teleconf uh, Living Teleconference every Saturday at 9 a.m. The TCOC Sisterhood is continuing to sell the book titled 30 Days to Taming Your Tongue for just $5. We will begin reading the book tomorrow, April the 1st, and conclude on April the 30th. Please see Sister Kim Harvey to purchase your book after morning worship. For those of you who have been curious about the TCOC Sisterhood leaders, now is your opportunity to get to know them. You have a chance to reach out to any of the sisters to become part of their group. Our goal is to ensure that every sister at TCOC is connected with a sisterhood group. Thank you for helping us to continue to foster unity, support, and support for a strong sisterhood community at TCOC. Everyone is encouraged to attend the 2024 MDC Spring Council, April the 2nd through April the 6th at the House of Prayer to All Nations, at 5501 North Park Drive, East St. Louis, Illinois, 62204. Registration is underway. General registration is $10. Young people under 21, seven. General, general registration plus all auxiliaries is $7, which is seven uh, for each individual auxiliary sessions. Check the website and app for a session location, date, time, speakers, and topics. And please remember that our own pastor is the MDC chairman and several of our members are leaders. The Christian Education Department, uh, new specialty class uh, starting this spring titled the Holy Spirit class will be led by Elder Andrew Williams and Minister Athelia Harrell. This eight week course will begin next Sunday, April the 7th in room six and seven on the lower level. The class is open to people of all ages. Please register in the back after service um, to get the book for only $10. Do you have any question? please see Minister Harrell today. TCOC is reading the book of Luke, chapters 16 through 24, in the book of John, chapters 1 through 21, during the 30 days in April. Check the TCOC app under events for the chapters and dates for the daily readings and check yes for the daily reading. All announcements and deta in details can be found on the TCOC Facebook app, website, and via Faith Teams text messages. Last but certainly not least, bags of goodies will, begin, uh, will be given to each child today after Easter, at this, um, Easter worship service, each child. The bags of candy are sponsored and donated by our TCOC sisterhood. Happy Resurrection Day, everyone. I now turn it over to the hands of our pastor. Thank you, Dr. Tim Staples, thank you. Hey, I just wanna underscore two announcements that Dr. Staples just gave us. One is um, Taming Your Tongue. This starts on tomorrow. Uh, a reading um, daily. The readings are really, really short. This is $5. This book is outstanding. I'm, I, I'll start in chapter one, but I got it kind of ahead, but it's really a wonderful book. Uh, the author talks about uh, Taming the Tongue and also going on a tongue fast. A tongue fast. I mean, certain things you just, I just, I'm not gonna say anymore. Uh, the flattering tongue, the manipulating tongue, the hasty tongue, the divisive tongue, the argumentative tongue, the boasting tongue, the slandering tongue, ooh, the gossiping tongue, the betraying tongue, the cynical, the know-it-all tongue, the tactless tongue, the rude tongue. Very, very sure I will hear a lot of <laughs> the judgmental tongue, the cursing tongue, the retaliating, the doubting tongue, and it's really short reading. The sisterhood, they have uh, embraced this, this book, and the, I'm asking the whole church to do it. It's a great book. The scripture says, death and life is in the power of the tongue. I want everybody to get a copy of the book. Now, we do a lot of reading here at, at Temple Church of Christ. We read uh, Pray Like This, The Bait of Satan, and now we're dealing with Taming Your Tongue. I believe reading is leading. Reading is like brain food for your mind. Uh, you read, read, read. And so this is a very powerful book. It only takes uh, less than 10 minutes to read a chapter. A chapter. But Sister Kim uh, Harvey, 
We stand Sister Kim. She, she's in the back. She's selling books for only $5. This is not a fundraiser. Uh, we're not trying to make money. But we're trying to give you information so that you can, you can be more powerful with what you say. And this tongue fasting, she talks about tongue fasting in several of the chapters. Like, you know, watch out what you say. Watch out what you say. Watch out how you say it. Please uh, invest in this as well. The second announcement I want to underscore is this council church was closed this week. There'll be no prayer meeting on tomorrow. There'll be no Bible study this coming Wednesday because we will be at the council. We'll be at the council. I'm very happy to announce that uh, Evangelist uh, Bowie, uh, who was speaking on Wednesday, is the mother, is the mother of sister, amen, Jalen Bowie. Stand up, Jalen. Curtsy. Hey, Jalen, curtsy if you stand up. Come on down. They just got married a couple of weeks ago. We haven't announced it yet. Come on down. Come on down real quick. We're going to dismiss in, in just three or four minutes. Mm -hmm. But they were married. If you don't know, Caleb Kersey's already taken. All right? He's taken. That's one just. And this is Jalen Kersey now. Her mom will be speaking on Wednesday. Uh, and we're very honored to have her. She now is a member here. She wants to have membership here at Temple Church of Christ. Amen. So we're glad to know that you're going to be a part of of our church we're honored to have you amen amen god bless you both but those two were married a couple of weeks ago last month and we celebrate them both so her mom is preaching on on wednesday on women's on women's night that's led by dr terry felt jones uh young people on tuesday with um is bishop bishop uh lee's son which is of uh, lee scott the second and then we have um, um virginia Bowie. And then we have on Thursday, we have Jonas Foote, Bishop Jonas Foote. And Friday, we have Bishop Gregory Wells. So I like everybody to participate in the, in the council. I'm the chairperson of the council, and I like to be representative of, the ch of my church. I like our church to support me as we go to Washington Park, uh, to House Spirit All Nations. I like if you support me in any fashion possible. We have multiple leaders here at Temple who are involved in the council. And I ask that you would just support us as well. Let's move on to our, our service as far as spent, but we certainly enjoyed the word that we've heard today. I ask if our ushers will come and our deacons will come and take leadership in the receiving of our of our offering. Amen. I want to offer a, a benediction, and then we shall proceed to the table to celebrate the Lord in our giving. And to all of our guests, if this is the first time you've been at Temple, will you please stand? We just want to recognize you before you leave. I know we've had a, a, a pretty power-packed service today, but any guests, if you're not a member of Temple Church of Christ, we just take a moment. We just want to would you stand. We want to celebrate your coming here. If this is your first time, the first, <laughs> first time, all right. But well, we're certainly grateful that you've come today and to celebrate with us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we celebrate you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for Calvary. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for your promise to return. And I pray, God, that you build our faith to believe that you died for us, to believe that you're coming back for us. I pray, God, you help us to be conscious of the love that you have for us. No matter what other people think, I pray you keep us focused on the love that you have for us, Jesus. Now, God, I pray you bless us as we leave this place. Allow us to arrive at our destination safely and give us peace and a great appreciation of the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen.